This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, UCLA law professor Joanna Schwartz discusses her book, Shielded, how the police became untouchable. She examines how the U.S. legal system handles police misconduct. She's interviewed by New York Law School professor Kirk Burkholter. South Carolina's economy is growing, bringing new businesses and opportunities. The need for electricity is growing, too. At Duke Energy, we're meeting the challenge, providing even more electricity that's reliable, that stays affordable. To do this, we're investing in our communities with a diverse, balanced mix of energy sources and making targeted upgrades to the grid so that South Carolina can thrive in a smarter energy future. Paid for by Duke Energy shareholders. The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton for the stay. Professor Joanna Schwartz, it's such a pleasure to finally meet you. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Very good, thank you. Very good. Um, I really uh, enjoyed uh, reading your book, even though the subject matter is quite a serious subject matter. So I feel a little uncomfortable saying I enjoyed it, but I always enjoy uh, being informed. Uh, And certainly as someone who focuses on these issues in my teaching and as a former uh, police officer here in New York City. I just found it absolutely fascinating. So um, I wanted to start off with uh, what what motivated you? I know this is your area of scholarship and focus, but broadly speaking, what motivated you to write this book? Well, I before I became a professor at UCLA, I was a civil rights litigator in New York City, uh, bringing lawsuits against uh, New York City police and uh, police officers at New York City Department of Corrections and, and other agencies in the area. And when I was in that practice, there were a lot of questions that came to mind about the way in which our system works, the way in which civil rights litigation uh, actually makes its way through the courts and the impact that it has on police officers and police departments because the underlying expectation is that these cases are gonna have an impact. But when I was bringing these cases, I came to learn that in New York City, at least, the money in these cases very rarely came out of police officers' pockets. And police officers and departments didn't even seem to have basic information about what happened in these cases. I would depose officers meaning question them under oath, and they didn't know how many times they'd been sued or what the allegations were in cases against them, what the outcomes were in these cases. And so these were the kinds of questions that got me uh, in, it really inspired when I became a professor at UCLA, and I started empirically testing these, these questions. And fast forward 10 years, uh, after 10 years of research and publishing papers in academic journals, looking at the impact of civil rights litigation on the ground, uh, George Floyd was murdered. And in May 2020 and in the months after, I was receiving constant calls from reporters and from legislators and legislative aides who wanted to understand our system of civil rights litigation, what worked and what didn't. And those conversations really inspired me to write Shielded as a way to share with a broader audience what all the barriers are to relief in a civil rights case and how those barriers came to be and how they impact the lives of real people uh, in our communities and what we should do to, to make the system work better. So you touched on something that's amazing. I was going to ask you next. Um, You know, when you're writing a a work like this, I think a lot of authors envision the reader and envision how they're going to impact the reader. And when they close the book after that final page, they have a thought or they're going to take action or do something or a response. 
What do you envision uh, the readers should get out of this book? What, do you, what would you, in a perfect world, what would you like to see the reader's response to this work? Well, I think, I think there are uh, three sort of main categories of things that I hope readers will get out of this book. One is simply understanding, uh, because our system uh, of civil rights litigation and civil rights uh, remediation is very complex. You, If you're an interested learner uh, or reader in this area, you might learn about one area of the law, qualified immunity, for example, which is a defense I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about uh, later on in the, in the conversation. But you might learn about one defense or, or one aspect of the system. My goal is first to really make the system clear, transparent, and understandable to a reader who is not uh, a, a lawyer in this area, um, but is interested in learning about it. And my goal is to learn, to educate folks, not just about one aspect of the system, but the entire system and the way in which it fits together. So that's one goal. I think another goal for me is to have written a book that leaves people really feeling for those in the book whose stories I tell, um, to understand the breadth of police violence and misconduct and the variety of people whose uh, lives it can touch and, and has touched, people who are never uh, whose stories never make the the news, who aren't the subject of mass protests, but have nevertheless had their lives really shaken to the core. And and telling those stories and understanding the real life impact of these barriers to relief in civil rights cases is a key part of my goal. And then I guess a third a third aspect of my uh, goals in writing this book is, as you say to offer a path forward. Uh, it is not a um, uplifting, uh, cheery book um, through, through much of it, or perhaps through, through all of it. But I do try to offer concrete steps, uh, steps that can be taken by the Supreme Court and Congress, but also by state legislatures, by local governments, city councils, and also by people simply reading the book and wanting some guidance about what they can do to make the system work better than it currently does. You know, it's great. You mentioned who the book was written for, and certainly as I was reading it, I could see it as a something that's written for uh, a work that's written for a practicing attorney, a work is written for those of us in academia, and a work that's written for the layperson and that was easily digestible. So I can only imagine it's fairly uh, difficult to do. Lawyers are not... Uh, particularly known for explaining the law to non-lawyers really well. So uh, kudos to you. Um, you know, there's so much, uh, so much work here. There's so much to offer uh, in this work. But I'd like to cherry pick a few uh, topics that I found uh, very interesting. So from the outset, you mentioned that basically a person who has been harmed uh, by the police uh, via the abuse of of force, they basically have three avenues for for redress. One through the criminal process, right? The police officer can be criminally prosecuted uh, through interdepartmental discipline, which could range from you know, the loss of pay, loss of vacation days, to termination, and then finally to uh, civil suits, which, as you mentioned, we'll get into because uh, qualified immunity plays a huge part in uh, civil suits. In your opinion, these three avenues of redress, would you advocate that they be modified? Uh, do you think we kind of need to start over or perhaps have some additional avenues of redress? Well, I certainly think that it, I do think that those are the three avenues that we have currently available to us and that none of them are, are, are working as they should um, or as they could if we are imagining a system uh, that actually compensates people whose rights have been wronged and deters future misconduct. Um, 
Nine, none of those systems work as they should. Um, criminal prosecutions are exceedingly rare when officers violate the law. And there's debate, and I think important debate, about whether the answer in these cases should be to send police officers to jail, whether that is the, you know, the, the way, if, if for those of us who don't believe that prison is particularly effective deterrent uh, for uh, people uh, who have been charged with crimes. I, I, I have some questions about whether that is the right system for uh, law enforcement officers as well. I, I, I would like to relook at, at that entire system if I had a, a magic wand to do so. Um, internal affairs investigations and discipline and terminations are, are really broken in, in much of the country. And this is in part because of uh, law enforcement officers' bills of rights, which uh, limit the the way in which officers can be investigated, and what the standards are for uh, sustaining investigations and disciplining and terminating officers. Um, and I sort of put my hope in this book in civil litigation as the best alternative among these three options. One reason, or a few reasons being, um, that people who have been wronged by the police can bring these claims themselves. They don't have to wait for a prosecutor to decide to bring a charge or an internal affairs uh, investigator to begin to investigate a case. And a person whose rights have been violated also through the litigation process can unearth important information about what happened uh, and 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 how things uh, went so wrong, which is often what victims of misconduct want to know. Um, that's information that criminal prosecutors and internal affairs investigators have no obligation to turn over. And that can happen in the civil litigation process. And people who have been harmed can receive money to compensate them for their losses uh, and potentially a court order uh, requiring that departments change their behavior, which again are things that can't happen through the criminal prosecution or the internal affairs investigation processes. So I think that civil rights litigation is a valuable tool uh, and, and makes sense as a tool to pursue, although much of my book is focused on the many barriers to relief in these cases. If, the, if I had that magic wand and I could create an alternative system I could certainly imagine uh, what that alternative system or aspects of it might look like. I think that uh, there has been experiments with forms of restorative justice or um, coming together, the, the officers and victims, um, to uh, really um, reach a, an understanding of um, what happened outside of the adversarial process. I think that the kinds of um, root cause analyses, sort of understanding what the real cause is of these errors or, or violations when they occur and figuring out how to uh, prevent it from happening again. That's, that's a kind of process that happens in uh, medicine. It happens in aviation. Uh, and those are ideas that um, have been there have been some working to to have those goals integrated into um, our criminal justice system. And I think that there's a huge potential in those and that we should explore those ideas more. Uh, with the system that we currently have, I think that civil litigation is the best available tool uh, among some imperfect alternatives. South Carolina's economy is growing bringing new businesses and opportunities. The need for electricity is growing too. At Duke Energy, we're meeting the challenge, providing even more electricity that's reliable, that stays affordable. To do this, we're investing in our communities with a diverse, balanced mix of energy sources and making targeted upgrades to the grid so that South Carolina can thrive in a smarter energy future. Paid for by Duke Energy shareholders. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, you know, I'm certainly not privy to every conversation on restorative justice. Uh, it's not necessarily my area of research. That being said, you're the first person that I've heard associate the concept of restorative justice 
uh, and pro- as possibly integrating it into uh, these parties, right, where you have a person, a civilian that's un- that was harmed by the police, and perhaps the police officer or officers or, you know, precinct commander really understanding, whatever entity, understanding uh, the harm that they have caused. Uh, do you think that would go anywhere? Do you, do you see possibilities there? Well, there are some examples of this happening, and I should say it's not an area of my expertise either. Um, actually, a, a student of mine, one of the sort of, one of the real beauties of uh, being a professor is that your students teach you so much. And I first started uh, understanding this possibility and thinking about it uh, from a student research paper who had looked at a similar type of process being used in Seattle following a police uh, shooting. Um, and I know there there is a lawyer um, named Alphonse Gerhard Stein who practices in Cincinnati who really thinks about these kinds of approaches as well. He represented the family of Philando Castile. And I've spoken with him also um, it, about these kinds of ideas, which he tries to integrate into his practice. So it is out there, um, but really at a case by case level. And in policing, it's it's often true that reforms burble up uh, from the, the bottom and from experimentation in individual departments. And so I think that there's uh, a possibility um, of those ideas taking more root in the future. There has to be the will to do so and the recognition of its importance. But uh, I think I think anything's possible. Certainly, certainly. Very interesting. Um, so moving back to to uh, the book, um, you know, I, I would characterize and this is just a term that I came up with, so I'm going to uh, copyright it. Uh, right. I would characterize the book as uh, an informative piece of advocacy. And why do I say that? Because there is a very strong historical narrative that helps the reader to understand uh, basically how we got to where we are today. Uh, and it's really interesting, and that comes to life. So I'm, you and I both, I'm sure, are certainly used to reading work where it's just case after case, and then this happened, and here's the holding. But you really dug into uh, the nuts and bolts uh, of some of these cases, and I felt like I was watching a video almost. Um, so along those lines, um, you know, you've, you, you use the... James Monroe case to uh, frame the narrative here early on, and you const- and you go back to that case often in discussing the developments of 1983 claims and qualified immunity. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that case and why you felt it was so important. Sure, and thank you for those uh, kind words about the uh, about the the book. Um, I've centered this case called Monroe versus Pape um, and the underlying facts of that case, because which I'll talk about in just a second, because Monroe versus Pape, uh, the M- Monroe versus Pape decision by the United States Supreme Court in 1961 is a crucial turning point in civil rights enforcement in our country. Um, it's the first time that the Supreme Court recognized that people could sue government officials for violating their constitutional rights. And so it was an extremely important decision uh, and and sort of opened the federal courthouse doors to these kinds of claims, which before Monroe versus Pape could only be brought in state court um, which state courts were considered far less um, hospitable to claims against local governments. Um, and, as, and as James Monroe's attorney uh, commented after their win, uh, bringing a claim by an African-American family against a politically powerful white police officer in state court um, in anywhere in the country was uh, going to be very, very difficult to win. And so this was the first time that a case like this could be brought in federal court. This is why Monroe versus Pape is such an important case in the history of 
Supreme Court decisions about civil rights and uh, the sort of development of, of this particular ability to sue. But I also think that the story of James Monroe and his family and what they endured is an extremely important story uh, for what it says about, um, for its similarities to things that we face today uh, and its similarity to things that were happening in uh, the 1860s and 1870s when Congress first enacted this right to sue. So it's an important historical bridge um, as well as a legal bridge. So James Monroe uh, was married to his wife, Flossie Monroe, and they had uh, six children and they were asleep in their Chicago apartment uh, in October of 1958. And in the middle of the night, they heard a loud pounding on their door. And it was a Chicago police detective named Frank Pape, who was infamous for uh, people, he was referred to as Chicago's toughest cop, and he liked to um, take photos of himself next to the bodies of people he killed. Uh, he was a uh, he was a, a, a very scary guy. It, it sounds like, and he and a number of other Chicago police officers broke into the Monroe's home without a warrant with their guns drawn. Um, they did this because a white woman earlier that day had identified James Monroe as uh, having killed her husband. In the truth of the matter, James Monroe had nothing to do with killing this woman's husband. In fact, this woman had arranged for her lover to kill her husband, to collect on his insurance money. And then she pointed out James Monroe as the person who had done the crime to avoid suspicion to herself and her lover. With that evidence, Frank Pape and his officers barged into the house, at gunpoint got James and Flossie Monroe out of bed, not wearing any clothes, brought them into the living room. Uh, Frank Pape beat James Monroe uh, while interrogating him about this murder and using odious racial slurs. Uh, the children came into the living room crying, screaming, seeing their parents being assaulted. And the police officers assaulted them as well. Uh, Houston Monroe, who was the eldest stepson of James Monroe, turned 17 that day. And he recalls that their screaming probably saved his father's life because they seemed like they were going to kill him. Uh, the officers then arrested James Monroe, took him to the station house, held him for hours without letting him see a judge or speak to a lawyer or have any phone calls. And then when the white woman couldn't pick him out of a lineup, he was eventually released. So this is a story, unfortunately, that we could be reading about in the news today. It's also a story that sounded eerily like the kinds of stories that prompted Congress in the years after the Civil War during Reconstruction to first pass this law that allowed people to sue for constitutional violations. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And, and I, that's what struck me as I was reading it. Uh, I think I could be reading something from today or yesterday or a few years ago or, as you mentioned, 100 years ago. So I, I found that absolutely amazing. Uh, you mentioned the law here that was passed uh, you know, during Reconstruction, 48, uh, I'm sorry, 42 U.S.C. 1983. Uh, so it's amazing how long uh, this particular statute has been around. This is, of course, where one can uh, sue the police department or a municipality for deprivation of their civil rights. Um, you know, I've heard it put all different types of ways, and I'll put the question to you. Uh, 1983 suits are the statute in and of itself. Is it dead? Is it on life support? Is it still alive and kicking? 
What's the future of 1983? I think it's still alive and kicking. And uh, it, certainly there are lawyers continuing to bring Section 1983 claims on behalf of people around the country whose rights have been violated. But the way in which the Supreme Court has interpreted various aspects of that law, uh, they have made it extremely difficult to succeed in these cases. So the lawyers bringing these cases would tell you and certainly have told me, and I know in my own experience from being a civil rights litigator, that Section 1983 remains a crucially important tool of compensation and deterrence. It just doesn't work anywhere near as well as it should. So I don't know if that means it's on life support or or uh, that, it, <laughs> that it needs some, some serious medical attention. Um, but I'm not willing to... Um, say that it is that it is gone because we need it as as we need it more today than ever before. So certainly 1983 exists to uh, for litigants, for those who suffer harm to be able to seek some form of redress. However, the entity that does the harm um, and we've seen this with the exclusionary rule, of course, right? The, The primary reason of the rule is to deter police misconduct. Is there is when 1983 was promulgated, was there any concept that this was also to deter misconduct or has that just turned into a byproduct? Well, I think that the if you read the legislative history, if you read what uh, Congress people were saying about the bill when they were uh, considering whether to pass it, it absolutely was viewed as a tool to prevent these kinds of harms from occurring again. It was viewed as a tool of deterrence to to prevent these harms from occurring. So I think that that has been an idea uh, throughout the existence of Section 1983. If you read the Supreme Court's decisions interpreting Section 1983, um, they repeatedly talk about the statute as an important tool of both compensation and deterrence. Now, the Supreme Court says that in in their actual decisions, they they seem to to lessen and lessen the ability to get compensation or deterrence um, through the through the statute. But that has, I think, from its inception, been an, an important set of goals, twin goals for the statute. So along those lines, um, I've just, you know, this is stepping forward into some of the latter uh, chapters in the book. You talk about other forms of redress that uh, could be effective, uh, court ordered reforms, which we certainly uh, see from time to time. There's almost always some police department somewhere in the United States operating under a consent degree, uh, decree, rather. Um, you mentioned uh, attaching the bank accounts of officers and possibly police officials, and of course, suing the city. I was wondering if you could expand on all three of those a bit, because it's quite interesting. Sure. It's it's my pleasure. So uh, if you think about how lawsuits can have an impact on behavior moving forward, there's a couple of uh, different ways in which that might happen. And I think um, all of them are uh, frustrated by our current system and the way in which the law works. So one of those ways is a court-ordered reform. In uh, a court case, a person who's suing can seek money damages. They can also seek what's called an injunction, which could be an injunction to change one police policy um, to create additional trainings or a a more comprehensive uh, set of reforms that would change uh, policies and practices and in a department more generally. Uh, The right to bring that kind of claim for injunctive relief in a civil rights case has been made extremely difficult 
by the United States Supreme Court, uh, which ruled in a case called uh, City of Los Angeles versus Lyons um, in the ni- in the early 1980s, that a person cannot bring a claim for injunctive relief unless they can prove that they will not only that their harms were violated in the past, but that they personally are likely to have their 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 rights violated in an identical way in the future. And to just give you a sense of how difficult that is, Adolf Lyons, who was the plaintiff in that case, uh, was driving in Los Angeles, was stopped for a broken taillight, I believe. And then after uh, some interaction with the officers, an officer placed him in a chokehold. He passed out um, and, uh, and then ultimately revived was not charged or arrested uh, with anything and allowed to to go on his way. He brought a lawsuit because he wanted the Los Angeles Police Department to stop using these chokeholds. And what the United States Supreme Court said was that Adolf Lyons could not sue for a change of policy because he could not prove that he would be stopped again on a Los Angeles street and that an officer would place him in a chokehold. This is, it would be very difficult for anyone to make that kind of proof in a case like this. And so the ability of individuals like Adolf Lyons to seek that kind of injunctive relief or systemic relief is near impossible in police cases. Now you're right, there are, it seems, always consent decrees pending against uh, city police departments across the country. Those cases are brought by the United States Department of Justice, which following the beating of Rodney King was granted authority to bring these kinds of cases. And in fact, it was the Lyons case that inspired Congress to give the Department of Justice this authority. But after opposition by union leaders and other uh, and others, Congress decided not to allow individuals like Adolf Lyons to bring these cases themselves. So seeking injunctive relief, forward-looking relief, is an important goal for many people who bring these cases, but it is very difficult to bring in our current system. So that's one aspect of our process for trying to prevent harms in the future. Another would be if you created financial sanctions. Um, The sort of presumption about deterrence and lawsuits is that if you are forced to pay or threatened with the the threat of having to pay uh, out of your bank account, that you will take steps to avoid that in the future. And in fact, that concern that officers will have to pay has motivated a lot of protections for officers when they're sued. But When I looked at uh, police misconduct settlements and judgments in 81 jurisdictions across the country over a six-year period, I found that officers paid only 0.02% of the dollars awarded to plaintiffs in these cases. And it was in two of the 81 jurisdictions uh, that I studied that I could confirm any payment. And the amount that was paid in these cases was on average about $4,000. So... These cases are not creating a financial sanction for officers. They're also not creating much of a financial sanction for departments because the money to pay settlements and judgments in these cases almost never comes from the budgets of these police departments. It rarely uh, creates any meaningful financial sanction for the department. Instead, the money tends to come from insurance or from general funds without an impact on the officers, I mean, excuse me, without an impact on the departments. The final way in which lawsuits could have some sort of deterrent effect is if police departments gathered and analyzed information from these cases to try to understand what had gone wrong and what they could do in the future to prevent something like that from occurring. But I found in doing my research that police departments rarely gather and analyze information from lawsuits brought against them. Instead, these cases are defended by the city attorney's office. As I said, any settlement or judgment is paid from central funds. And the department itself often does not even have 
the information that's revealed during discovery, for example, and doesn't make any effort to analyze the information in these cases for trends in officers who are repeatedly sued or types of behavior that repeatedly result in lawsuits uh, or stations within a department that garner a, a disproportionate number of claims, all the kinds of analysis that you would expect a uh, employer to do if they were trying to figure out how to reduce uh, settlements and judgments against them. But it rarely happens in departments. Mm -hmm. This is a long-winded way of saying there are a lot of ways in which uh, these kinds of suits could deter future behavior, but all of the mechanisms are uh, dysfunctional right now. And And the cause is a combination of the Supreme Court Uh, state laws that are providing that local governments pick up the tab when their officers violate the Constitution, and local governments that don't do enough, in my view, to require their police departments to gather and analyze information from lawsuits brought against them. Professor, what do you think about the argument uh, that comes from the unions, those involved in the collective bargaining process, that, you know, if we allow for the attachment of police officers, bank accounts and homes and so forth, um, no one would ever take this job and the country would be less safe. So I'm sure you've heard that argument and you've considered it. What, what do you think about that argument? Well, the, the first thing I think is that this is uh, unlikely to happen as a practical matter. Um, those kinds of arguments about officers getting bankrupted uh, for reasonable mistakes are often used in opposition to uh, reform of a legal protection called qualified immunity. Um, But there is an entirely different set of protections that are protecting officers' bank accounts. These are indemnification agreements, meaning uh, state or local agreements or laws providing that when an officer is sued, uh, the the employer is going to pay for the lawyer and for any settlement and judgment. I actually think that this system is is an important system to have. Not everyone in uh, police reform circles agree with me for sure, but I believe that cities should be picking up the tab, or at least the vast majority of the tab, uh, when officers violate their constitutional rights. Uh, One of the reasons why I believe this is because one of the goals of these claims is compensation. And police officers are rarely going to have the kind of money that is required to fully compensate a person for their harms. Uh, When George Floyd's family sued the city of Minneapolis and Derek Chauvin uh, and the case settled for $27 million dollars, I can assure you that uh, Derek Chauvin did not have $27 million to offer George Floyd's family. Um, There is a value in having a city uh, pay that kind of uh, bill for the compensation of the family. And, And also, I think, for a recognition that these police officers are funded and given their authority by us, by the community, by the taxpayers. Uh, And we have a uh, collective responsibility for the harms that they cause. Uh, These are harms that are going to be felt by victims. um, And really the question in these cases is who should bear those costs? If we put the costs on the police officer directly and an officer cannot pay, ultimately what we're really doing is saying that the victim needs to pay those costs themselves. With that said, I think there's a value in creating financial sanctions for officers when they cross the line. And there have been some interesting um, experiments in Colorado, for example. Uh, They passed a statute in 2020 that provided that when an officer uh, violates the law, uh, the city will pay on behalf of the officer. But if the city concludes that the officer acted in bad faith, the officer can be required to contribute up to $25,000 or 5% of any settlement or judgment, whichever is less. 
And if they don't have the resources and can prove they don't have the resources, the city will pick up the entire tab. I think this is an interesting approach because it does ensure that the victim will be compensated for their harms, but it also creates a financial sanction for officers who have acted in bad faith. I think this is an interesting approach and one that should be considered and uh, experimented with in more states. It's a very interesting approach. And needs to say, insurance is not my expertise, but I always wonder if we'll see a day where police officers are purchasing, purchasing rather insurance, such as the way doctors uh, purchase malpractice insurance, doctors, lawyers, and other professionals. If we want policing to truly move into the professional sphere, then, you know, it's inevitable that they will be treated as such. So it's just it's really an interesting problem. Or, and, or, and I should say, know. I think that's, that is another uh, way of going about things. And uh, that is an approach that, um, for example, my, uh, my friends at the Cato Institute who are really focused on issues of qualified immunity, they prefer uh, that approach, personal liability insurance for officers to carry. It's also an idea that has been proposed uh, elsewhere. Um, In fact, in Minneapolis, in I believe 2016, there was a a, a provision that was introduced, but later voted uh, not to get on the ballot because it conflicted with union, uh, the union contract. But that proposal would have required officers to have individual liability insurance. And if I recall correctly, the way that the plan would work was that the city would pay the base insurance level for all of the officers. But if an officer was viewed as risky by the insurer, whether because they had had a number of use of force events or they had been sued numerous times and their insurance premiums rose, the officer would be responsible for those increases in premiums above the base level. And I think that's a fascinating idea as well. I'm, I, if, if, uh, if we could experiment with that more across the country, I think that that would be um, a really interesting thing to take a look at because it does create a financial sanction again for the officer who is engaged in risky behavior. As we saw in Minneapolis, the the proposal died because it conflicted with the union's agreement with the city. And so these kinds of changes uh, will likely face that same opposition if they are explored elsewhere. Sure. So, you know, it's very interesting if you think of all the different ramifications. If a city won't take action against uh, someone who is a rogue law enforcement official, well, then maybe the insurance companies will. Someone can't get insurance to, to practice medicine, to practice law, can't get insurance to to, to uh, perform the duties as a police officer. It'd be interesting. Um, and they, this has also been done, I should say, in small jurisdictions. Uh, in it, small cities and towns usually rely on liability insurance instead of paying settlements and judgments from mm-hmm. their own budgets. And there are examples of municipal liability insurers uh, as they see claims rise in a jurisdiction either threaten to uh, decrease coverage or require that the department take some action. Uh, Even in in one example, a requirement that the city fire their police chief. And there's a way in which an insurer who is guided by the bottom line, by money, uh, has more leverage than local government officials who are considering financial concerns, sure, but are also uh, in the grips of whatever uh, political pressures there are, um, political obligations uh, to the police department, and and sometimes don't have the kind of leverage to demand the the kinds of decisive actions that a municipal liability insurer can. Okay. I mean, just fascinating. You know, I want to shift gears. I'd like love to shift gears here to a uh, topic that is so near and dear to my heart. I could talk about it forever. And that is the Fourth Amendment. (laughs) Uh, I always find it so fascinating that just a few lines in our Constitution uh, 
has been interpreted just so many different ways and is ever expanding. Um, But you trace the development of Fourth Amendment law from uh, this concern solely about the rights of the individual, basically, right? That's what the framers were concerned about, to uh, the courts, and I mean the Supreme Court's concern about the police and the the ability of the police to uh, conduct um, investigations and police work. And I don't know, and I look at the Fourth Amendment, I don't see the word police in there, but that's just me. Not <laughs> so, it's not there. It's not there. <laughs> um, you know, and, and you kind of look at Terry v. Ohio and the, uh, the, the occurrences with D- Detective McFadden as a watershed moment. And, and I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit about that. Why do you see it as a watershed moment? And uh, tell us a little bit about the case. Sure. So you're right. I I don't see the words uh, police in the Fourth Amendment either. uh, And the protection against unreasonable searches and seizures really does seem focused on the subjects of those searches, the, the victims of potentially that overreach. But the Supreme Court has repeatedly interpreted the Fourth Amendment Uh, not in terms of what we, the people, are entitled to in terms of of sanctity of our homes and our possessions um, and our our bodies, but in terms of what the police are authorized to do in light of their uh, need to prevent and control crime. And that analysis or, or weighing has repeatedly uh, by the Supreme Court been been done with a real thumb on the scale for the police to, I think, the detriment uh, of, of us as a society as a whole. And I do um, talk about Terry as a key moment in that shift. Um, Terry is a, is a case involving a police officer who saw a couple of guys who looked suspicious. They looked like they could be um, looking to, to try to case uh, out of a business to, to rob it. And ultimately, after uh, sort of monitoring these guys for a while, the officer stopped them and searched them and found a gun. And the question was uh, whether this was reasonable for the officer to do. At the time that Terry was decided in the late 1960s, the question of police power to stop and search or stop and frisk people uh, was really being debated uh, by courts and by advocates. uh, And to the police view, there needed to be maximum discretion to do this. They, they, the, the law enforcement sort of side of the argument was that this shouldn't even be viewed as covered by the Fourth Amendment. It wasn't a full search. And police should be able to do this for any reason uh, as a means of controlling crime. Uh, advocates on the other side saw this as an enormous problem and thought that you uh, police should only have a, a warrant or probable cause in order to search someone. And if you read the brief offered by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to the court in the Terry case, they talk about the the massive numbers of stops and searches that were being done in predominantly uh, black and neighborhoods and neighborhoods uh, of people with color, people of color, and, and said, we don't need more of this. We need more protections from it. The Supreme Court, looking at these two sides, uh, decided sort of to to find some sort of middle ground or what they considered to be middle ground. And so what the Supreme Court said was, yes, the Fourth Amendment applies. You don't have unfettered discretion, court uh, cops, to do these searches. But it's not as much as the Fourth Amendment's full protection. You don't need a warrant or you don't need probable cause. All you need, the Supreme Court said, was reasonable suspicion to believe that the person had done something wrong or if in the case of a search that they had something um, on their person that that created a danger. So although the court viewed this as a compromise, I think, between 
two competing considerations. This reasonable suspicion standard has come to play an enormous role in the Fourth Amendment. Um, and just as one example, um, there is a requirement that is centuries old that before police enter your home, they have to knock and announce their presence in order to let the people inside know that the police are there. And the view is that this will protect both property so that you know doors won't have to be broken down and the like, and also will protect people's safety. They won't think that some intruder is breaking into their home. Uh, they will know that it's the police. But the Supreme Court in the 90s said that officers have, can do away with the requirement of knocking and announcing beforehand, so long as they have a reasonable suspicion, the language taken from Terry, to believe that knocking and announcing would be fruitless or would be harmful to their investigation. And as a practical matter, the requirement to knock and announce has essentially gone away with that lessening of the standard because officers can uh, come up with virtually any reason to believe uh, or to, to have a reasonable suspicion that knocking and announcing would be fruitless. So it's a standard, this reasonable suspicion standard initially meant to be a compromise, has come to really dominate in many ways uh, what the standards are for police to stop and engage and search uh, people. And you quote Justice Douglas's dissent, and I'd love to read it. Uh, Yet if the individual uh, is no longer to be sovereign, if the police can pick him up whenever they do not like the cut of his jib, if they can seize and search him in their discretion, we enter a new regime. And I wonder if Justice Douglas had a crystal ball into what occurred uh, in New York and, and other cities with regards to stop and frisk. Are we in this new regime that Doug, uh, Justice Douglas uh, discussed? We are, absolutely. And Justice Douglas uh, plays a repeated role in the book and in the chapters of the book and in the development of constitutional law and constitutional protections as a, often a sole vo voice or a dissenting voice saying, watch out, watch out what you're doing here. This is this is this cannot be um, what we believe the Constitution requires. And I do think that he he, he must have had a crystal ball hiding in his chamber somewhere because uh, he, he's absolutely right that allowing officers to stop and frisk people based on reasonable suspicion, that standard has absolutely uh, led to the kinds of widespread discriminatory use of stop and frisk, overuse of stop and frisk in New York City and in Philadelphia and in, in cities across our country. I mean, the, 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 the stop and frisk practices of police have been studied over and over again throughout our uh, country. And repeatedly, the finding is that people of color are more frequently stopped and searched, um, that people are stopped and searched the vast majority of the time without having done, with having done nothing wrong, having no evidence of weapons or drugs or anything else. And these stops and searches are are very intrusive. Um, they, they create uh, their own real harms um, that the Supreme Court's doctrine really allows, again, without any compensation or, or recovery for these people. People who are stopped and searched without any justification are left to carry the costs of those harms themselves. So in, the, in about five minutes, uh, the five minutes that we have left or so, um, like to talk just a little bit about uh, a better way. And I love the title of that chapter. It's the last chapter of the book where you discuss compensation and deterrence and provide the reader with your thoughts on how uh, to achieve this and how to actually find a better way where uh, we can coexist. Where, well, you know, I hate to say coexist because we talk about police and civilians, 
there's no coexistence. We're all citizens of the United States. So, uh, yeah. you know, make it sound like there are two different entities. But right. you focus on uh, better right. ways to achieve uh, these goals. Could you tell us a little bit about that in the time remaining? Sure. Well, I do think that our system needs to do a better job of compensating and deterring people whose rights are violated. As I mentioned before, I think that those dollars should typically come from city budgets. Uh, but I do think that uh, officers, as, as in the Colorado statute, should be more often required to make some contribution to those settlements and judgments when they've acted in bad faith. I think that local governments uh, should create more consequences for police departments in these cases. And part of that could be having money come from police departments' budgets. Part of it can come from uh, local governments requiring that their departments take better account of the cases that are brought against them and endeavor to learn more from those cases. I think that that, that system uh, would make us come closer to a, a, a just system. I also think that plaintiffs should more often win these cases. I think that uh, the states and Congress and the Supreme Court uh, could all roll back some of the protections that uh, that the government enjoys, including the interpretation of the Fourth Amendment, including qualified immunity doctrine. I think it should be easier to sue local governments directly for the harms that their officers cause. Um, and so I think there's a lot that could be done in terms of the, the ability to get relief. I also think that there's a lot that can be done at the state and local level and by listeners, by people who are uh, interested in making improvements. I think a lot can happen at the city council level in terms of uh, how police department budgets work and whether uh, police departments are gathering and analyzing information from lawsuits. This is, these are things that the city governments can uh, require or put into place. And those are things that uh, community members can ask of their city councils. Uh, I also think that, that at the most basic level, uh, having representation in local government, city and state uh, government, um, who, people who are committed to these kinds of reforms are important. And there's ways for people to get involved uh, in either being those people themselves or, or getting people uh, in those positions of, in, of power. And at the very most basic level, uh, people can serve on juries in these cases and and uh, have a whole chapter about the challenges of getting an unbiased jury in these cases. Uh, and so jury service is an important role to play. For those lawyers who are listening, uh, I hope that they consider taking these cases in the future. Uh, civil rights cases, as, as much as we might think that uh, the courthouses are teeming with civil rights lawyers. There's actually a lot of parts of the country where civil rights cases uh, are, are virtually, or civil rights litigants are virtually, uh, uh, it's very difficult to find lawyers that are, that have the expertise and the willingness to take these cases. Uh, and I think getting more lawyers uh, working on these cases is a critically important part of the process as well. So there's a lot of challenges in these cases, but it also means there's a lot of different ways to improve the system and a lot of ways for people to get involved. Well, thank you so much. So the name of the book is Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. The author is Professor Joanna Schwartz from uh, US, uh, UCLA. Sorry. Listen, it's been such a pleasure. Watch speaking out with now. You. I know. I know. I almost got you in trouble there. Um, <laughs> listen, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, so informative. The work is excellent, and I encourage folks to read it. So uh, thank you very much for the conversation. Oh, thank you for the conversation. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Take care. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. <laughs>